name is Michael from Blue Sky Bio. I'd like to welcome everybody who's joining us for today's presentation. Please make sure to enter your details in the webinar attendance form so that we can send you the CE credits. There are links to the attendance form underneath the video viewing windows. If you have questions during the presentation, please enter them into the QA box and we'll try to address them during the presentation. We are going to be hearing tonight from Dr. Michael Ravens. He's been doing guided surgery for a very long time and specifically been involved with Blue Sky Plan, feedback, comments, suggestions, and contributing to future builds and releases as well. He's going to be presenting using a pre-release version of Blue Sky Plan that hasn't been rolled out and is not yet available via the Blue Sky Via website. If you like to receive a pre-release copy, then please email us at plan at blueskybio.com and we can send it over. It should be live within a week or two on the Blue Sky Bio website. Dr. Michael Ravens will be presenting on techniques that will help the dentist incorporate guided surgery into their implant practice in a way that is pro profitable, predictable, and fun, resulting in a quick, efficient, and less stressful surgery. Dr. Ravens? Uh, thank you, Mike. So as Mike said, uh, one of my goals in dentistry as a whole is to make the procedures very predictable, very straightforward, and so you have less chances of making a mistake, and also you can increase your efficiency, uh, and you can lower your costs for yourself and for your patients. And uh, just a little background, I'm a general dentist. I practice um, with my father and my brother in Massachusetts, and I have a CVCT, I have a CareStream 9000, I have a Seric Omnicam, and I just recently added the Form 2 3D printer to my office. So I love everything with technology. I think it's a lot of fun, and I think it's uh, great for the patients. And I think more importantly, if you're going to add some technology, it has to be a benefit um, not only for your patients, but also for your practice as a whole. It has to make you more efficient. Um, and that's what guided surgery does. So today or tonight, I hope that I'll show you a little bit about how I practice. Uh, we'll go over the new software, the pre-release, which has a couple of new features or actually a lot of new features, some of which I'm still getting myself accustomed to. And rather than just spending a lot of time on this is how you make guides, this is how you do it, I hope I share some broader concepts on how I practice and how it's made my practice very enjoyable and um, profitable and you know the patients really uh, I think benefit in the end. Uh, so I teach, I do teach a hands-on course with um, Dr. Garg and implant seminars. We've been doing that I think for for over two years now or about two years now and so it's a lot of fun so a lot of people have taken that course and, and a lot has changed. Uh, I taught a couple of the first webinars when Blue Sky Plans first started making the software available so you can make the surgical guides within the software and um, we started started some of the threads on dental town and it was kind of where we sort of helped develop the software um, so without further ado let's get started so some of the topics that i would like to cover tonight are the biomax np implant that blue sky bio sells it's the implant that i've been using and I think it's, for general dentists, it's probably your best option if you're going to uh, either start placing implants or you're going to switch to a new implant. Uh, I'd also like to cover the new mini tie base for the Biomax. This is more specific for people who uh, use utilize CEREC in their practices. And then I'd like to show a simple guided surgery setup, basically how I practice and it's a great way not only to get into guided surgery, but it's also it's also how I prefer to practice. Um, and then uh, guide stop adjustments. This is actually something that somebody posted on our Blue Sky Bio Study Club on Facebook, um, and they were asking about some guide stops uh, questions. And so I thought maybe I'd touch on that tonight and just show a, a quick little. Thing that you can do to adjust uh, your guide stops and so you can use this short drill and things you have to look for in that because I think the software now is getting 
uh, much easier to use to actually make the guide. Now it's really important that you understand the nuances of when you're making the guide, what to really look for. Um, PVS and stone model, CVCT scanning for um, creating STL models. The new software has really gotten much more efficient with that. I first scanned stone models about two years ago and did surgery on um, that way, and it works. It was a little cumbersome, but it definitely works. Um, and then I'll touch a little bit on the form two, which I've had for about a month now, and I just got in the new uh, surgical guide resin. And then I'll show you, we have a Blue Sky Bio Study Club on Facebook, which I really recommend if you're using the software. There's a great group of dentists on there that help each other out. And you know, uh, you can really learn a lot, even if you don't have any questions, just by seeing other cases. So the Biomax NP implant, I think if you're a general dentist, which is the primary group that I interact with, it, this is probably your best bet in terms of the implants to use. All the implants have a Noble Active NP platform. Basically what this means to you is you don't have to sit there and wonder what type of impression post you need or what type of healing abutment you need. Every implant takes the same this has the same connection. And what Blue Sky Bio has done is they've strengthened the connection so that the NP platform, even though it's narrow, can withstand uh, the forces in molars. And the great part about it is that, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to be efficient. We're trying to reduce our inventory. We're trying to have the patient in and make sure we have all the pieces that we need. And, um, you look at some of the other implants and there's you have to stock six different impression copings for them. Uh, with, with the Biomax, one impression coping will fit all of your implants, whether it's a three millimeter implant or the wide seven millimeter molar implants that they have. Uh, the healing buttons are all interchangeable. So if you place a smaller diameter implant, you can place a larger sized healing abutment on there and that will help you create a better emergence profile, make impressions easier and make seeding the final restoration much easier. And without having to go out and either customize a healing abutment or buy, um, you know, buy um, custom healing abutments. There are also two tie bases that are available for CEREC. So obviously there's a lot of CEREC doctors that love um, Blue Sky Bio because they're one of the more innovative companies out there. And they also listen to the dentists and they react very quickly if we have a concern or we have a suggestion. And having these two tie bases, I think are very important to have. And I'll show a case uh, in a little bit about what the different uh, the differences are between them, how to utilize the mini tie base, and I think once you see how to use it, uh, if you're a CEREC doctor, it'll make the Biomax much more um, appealing. You can also get custom titanium abutments uh, where you just uh, you can send out an impression to a lab and they'll make a custom mill titanium abutment and then you can either create your own crown on it or send it out to a, a lab to have the crown made on it. I really do like custom titanium abutments. Um, I do use the, um, the tie bases a lot. If you don't know what the tie bases are, I'll explain that in a little bit. But I think having a custom titanium abutment is really nice. And uh, it's got basically the widest variety of implant sizes. And quite frankly, this is the best price for the implant. Um, which really helps out when you have a patient who needs multiple implants. It's, you can add in an extra implant with very little cost to you, especially if you're doing them with guided surgery. Uh, and then you can, you, know, you can help pass that savings on to the patient and maybe increase your uh, case acceptance and do bigger and better cases. Uh, so there's larger stock healing abutments that can be placed on smaller diameter implants. So that's a 3.5 millimeter implant and that is a 4.3 millimeter healing abutment. So it helped, uh, it helps when I, I do a lot of screw retained crowns, so it really helped with seeding that. Um, and this is a case that you'll see a little bit of later. Um, the healing abutments come in three and a half, 4.3, 4.7, and six millimeter diameters, and then they come in three and five millimeter heights. Uh, so you, you, you just have to stock 
those. You don't need, and you don't have to worry, did I run out? As long as you've got healing abutments, you'll be fine uh, in your practice. You don't have to you know, double check what's the implant, what's this. It really makes things a lot easier. And this is a different case than the previous one, although it, it certainly is the same, uh, looks like about the same spot. But this is the first guided surgery case uh, that I did with Blue Sky Plan. And so if you look at some of the old webinars and you look at some of the, um, the dental town postings, you, you might see this case. But the Biomax implant takes the noble active NP tie base, which in the CEREC software is designated as NBA 4.5L. Uh, again, it's really nice. You only have to stock one tie base and one scan post for the CEREC, although we have the new mini tie base. So now you can stock two tie bases, but um, that's really only primarily used in certain situations. Uh, you can create screw retained or custom abutments using the Emacs L blocks. And these tie bases work really well for the 4.35 and 7 millimeter implants. And they can be too wide for the 3.5 and certainly the 3 millimeter implants, where they almost create sort of a reverse platform switch, so to speak. Um, and they, it's basically the bone can, or the soft tissue can really impinge upon seating. What you see on the right side is a 4.3 by 10 millimeter implant with the regular uh, tie base that's used on it for a screw retained crown. If you're not familiar with the CEREC process, what we do is we scan, we attach a scanning post onto the uh, implant, we scan it, we design a crown. It's a, um, it has a pre-milled or a pre-poured connection to the tie base and then the crown is bonded to the tie base and that is all um, torqued down and then a small occlusal composite is placed on there. Now you can also, if you don't have a CEREC but you have an other optical scanner, you can, you can get uh, scan bodies and do something similar with the lab where you can scan it and you just have to tell them that it's the Nobel active NP connection and you can also uh, do that. I know. I know some. Of, a lot of the big labs do stock, uh, of course, stock scan bodies for this. Um, or you can take a traditional PBS impression and send it out. I think one of the nice things with guided surgery is that you tend to get to do a lot of screw retained crowns because you can control the um, the angle of the implant much more precisely. So a lot of times it's coming right out of the occlusal, and certainly makes life a lot easier. So let's talk a little bit about this new mini tie base. And it, if you look at the pictures, the tie base that is sandblasted, that has that matte color um, to it, is the regular tie base for the NP platform for Biomax. And then the tie base that is not sandblasted is the new mini tie base. And you can see them placed on a... Um, a Biomax implant, I believe that's a 4.3 millimeter implant. And you can see the difference in, in the uh, diameter. When you designate them in the CEREC software, you want to choose a tie base and you want to choose BC 3.4S. You must mill an Emacs S block. Now, not a lot of implants take the S block, so um, you may not have these in stock, but you definitely, if you're going to use this, you, you'll have to order those. Uh, the other thing is that there is not a scanning post available. So if, if the implant is fairly deep, you may be better off taking a PBS impression and working off of that. I, I primarily find that these are useful for you know, lower incisors, uh, lateral incisors, maxillary lateral incisors, and also there's some, you know, if you have a premolar case where there's, there's very little space, and that's also, they're very helpful there. So this was uh, the first case that I did with the uh, mini tie base. And this is tooth number 10. It was, um, I believe it was a failed, failed endo and uh, maybe a fracture on the tooth. I forget exactly. It was an extraction, immediate implant placement. I, I cannot find my pictures, but I, I made a surgical guide and I placed a 3.5 by 10 millimeter Biomax implant in there. And 
I honestly was planning on a titanium, custom titanium abutment uh, to restore because there was no way I was going to get the regular tie base in there. And then Dr. Lerner, one of the founders of Blue Sky Bio, called me and said, hey, we've got these new mini tie bases. And I said, well, I have the perfect case for it. Now, I did scan this intraorally, uh, but you can see that if you're a CERC guy, you know that there is a, uh, a notch. And you, it's, I lined it up, and I was able to feel that it went in. Uh, but you certainly, it can be a challenge to line these up in the mouth. I also did take a PBS impression just to verify everything on there. Normally, I temporize the anteriors. I, for some reason, I chose not to on this one. I think the patient, I think it was difficult to get him in here. And so I just took the impression and I said, come back. And you'll see the case, I think, came out pretty nice. So in the software, I created a custom abutment which is an Emax uh, MO block, a medium opacity block that gets bonded to the tie base. And then on top of that, I created a, uh, an Emax crown. If you look back one slide, no, teeth number seven and eight are both implants with Emax crowns on them. And they're both implants that were done with a delayed approach. He lost a significant amount of bone and the, the tissue around them are not necessarily that healthy, there's not a lot of keratinized tissue. I didn't do those implants. Um, but so I, when, I, when he had the opportunity to have an immediate place, I said, let's give it a try uh, because your results otherwise have been pretty poor. So that on the left-hand side of the screen is the custom um, Emacs abutment that's been bonded to the mini tie base, it's just, it's placed into a 4.3 millimeter implant because that's what I have, I, I just have lying around. Uh, and then on the top is the Emax crown before it's been uh, crystallized, been fired. Uh, on the right hand side, you can see the custom abutment that's been placed and torqued down. And then this is the final. Um, you know, tooth number 10, I think it looks really nice. It certainly beats uh, seven and eight. And eventually the, 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 eventually the plan is going to be, number nine is eventually gonna go, and we'll probably do a fixed bridge from, from a eight to 10, I think, is what the patient wants. So he, he does not, he just wants to treat one tooth at a time, so that's fine. Uh, and then these are the x-rays. Comparing on the left-hand side, that's the regular tie base, which is designated again as the NBA 4.5L. And you can get that. Of course, both tie bases are available from Blue Sky Bio. And you can see in this, in that particular case, it actually worked out fairly well. Uh, that was tooth number nine. And uh, it was, that's a fantastic x-ray, by the way, by my assistant. Uh, the other, uh, you can see this is the right-hand picture. It's the mini tie base. That's the case that I just showed you. And based on where, where the bone is and everything, you would really have a hard time getting that other that wider tie base in there uh, it's not quite as good an x-ray I probably took that one so I'll take the blame for that one but um, you know it gives you an idea of how much narrower it can be and again that's an immediate case with a surgical guide um, that really really went well and if you don't have a CERC it's no problem obviously I'm biased because I do have one but uh, if you don't have one there are there's a million different options. This is again why the Biomax I think is the best implant that that Blue Sky Bio sells because it, it has basically every option you could think of from the overdentures to um, you know the custom abutments and uh, they have the kiss abutments which if you have really nice placement you just um, you screw in the um, the abutment and then it has a little plastic cap that's that is put on there and you can take an impression the cap just comes right off and then you fit an analog into it um, and then there's um, they also have custom abutments that you can customize yourself and the abutment also acts as the uh, the impression coping uh, UCLA abutments angled abutments pretty much everything you could think of so simple guided surgery setup this is what I teach in my courses because a lot of people that come to take the course, if, you've, if you're familiar with Dr. Garg, he's all about being efficient, you know, per, um, understanding the type of cases that you should be treating, and also making it so 
um, you know, the patient is, is able to afford treatment because if you're not placing implants, then you're not learning and, and your practice isn't growing. So you need to find a happy balance. So a lot of people come into my course and they, they might place a bunch of different type of implants and they don't necessarily want to spend five or $10,000 on a guided surgery setup. And there's a lot of people who insist that you must go fully guided. You have to be fully guided. And I, I will, you know, I, I'm not going to argue with them that that's necessary, but I don't really think it is. And I think if you're, if you're doing a guided osteotomy and you're placing the implant by hand or you're, you're going to be significantly improved over freehand. And it's also going to allow you, especially if your reimbursements for implants are low, to really keep your costs down while still providing a very, very accurate uh, implant placement. Certainly compared to freehand, they're really, you know, they're not even in the same league. Uh, and then if you decide to go on to fully guided surgery, once you understand the software, you understand how to make uh, guides, then you certainly can go ahead and purchase a fully guided system. But this way, you know, if you're watching this webinar, a lot of you are just starting out in guided surgery. This way you don't spend $5,000 and then it ends up sitting in a closet somewhere. Um, so what am I talking about? There's a universal BioCut solution. Uh, if you're not familiar, the Blue Sky Bio drills are a direct cut drill. So what, they, what that means is that you can skip the pilot, the starter drills and everything. And you can go right to your final drill. Uh, which is really great. Now, for a lot of people, if you're not placing Biomax implants or you're, you're placing a different brand of implant than what Blue Sky Bio sells, um, then you, what you can do is you can treatment plan for one drill smaller than the implant, and then you can do your final drill freehand at a low RPM. Say, I run mine at 600 RPM, but what, what that will accomplish is, is you'll have an osteotomy of, say, uh, 2.6 millimeters, and if you're placing a 3.2 millimeter implant, you may just take your final drill, enlarge the osteotomy. We're only talking two, three, four hundred microns, so it's not like all of a sudden the implant's going to be 50 degrees off angle. It's going to be very accurate, and this allows you to get into guided surgery inexpensively, and um, you know, without it allows you to, to, to develop your sense of um, confidence in the guided surgery and then you can figure out exactly where you want to go by a, by a fully guided kit if that's what you want. There was a post on our uh, on the on Facebook on our Blue Sky Bio study club and it was by somebody who uh, it was it was a post about the last 2000 surgical guides printed and it was a breakdown of of the different types of guides and of the last 2000 I believe about 90 were fully edentulous guides, so about four and a half percent, and then pretty much everything else was for one or two implants. And so what that tells you is that everybody gets excited to place all on four, all on six, which is fantastic. But realistically, in most practices, you're placing one or two implants at a time. So you know it's really behooves you to really pay attention to making guides, good guides, on how to place you know, your bread and butter implants and to do it efficiently. Uh, and then when you get larger cases, if you're doing a lot of edentulous guides, then certainly you'll learn, be able to learn the software. But if you only do one a year, then you're really better off, in my opinion, working with a lab or a, you know, a company that specializes in, in the treatment planning because there's a lot more mistakes that you can make. So if you go onto the website, you can purchase these universal BioCut solutions. If you buy the first three drills, the 2.6, the 3.2, and the 3.6 millimeter drills, and you buy the corresponding metal guide tubes, then every single time you make a surgical guide, all you have to do is set your guide hole diameter to four and a half millimeters and make your surgical guide. Every single one of those guide tubes will fit into your into, into your surgical guide, and then you can use whichever drill you want. If you want to do sequential drilling, you can actually just pop the guide tube out in the surgery, pop the next one in, and use the next drill. Um, I personally don't do that. I just pick one drill, go with it, freehand the last drill or two, place the implant. I think it's the simplest, most economical way to do guided surgery, and I think it's very accurate. Um, 
One of the things to keep in mind if you're placing an implant 10 millimeters or less and you're using the Blue Sky Bio handpiece, you're most likely going to be using the short drill. If the implant is greater than 10 millimeters, you're going to be using the long drill, but I'll show you uh, in a couple of minutes how you can adjust that so you can use the short drill for slightly longer implants. I think I just uh, covered a lot of this. Um, and one thing I would say, if the cortical bone is very thick and you put the guide on and you go to try to punch through it and you're, you are having difficulty going through it, say you're using the 3.6 millimeter drill, then what you want to do is take the guide off, look at where the mark is on the cortical bone, punch through with a pilot drill, maybe the starter drill, put the guide back on, and then finish it with your um, direct cut drill. Uh, the other reason I should mention that I don't, I, I like to do one drill less than the final drill is because if the bone is a little bit softer and you take the final drill to depth and then you realize I should have underprepared the osteotomy, then you're, it's too late at that point. So that is just my personal preference, although a lot of people um, do like to take the final drill down, um, but that's just how I like to practice and, and it's worked out really well for me. And I'll show you a case where it worked out perfectly. So I think I might be one slide out of order here. Let me just skip through. Oh, this is uh, this is um, I, it's part of the form too. What I was going to talk about with that, but this is a case where I prepared the. The, uh, the site with a 3.6 millimeter drill. And you can see the osteotomy that it made on the right hand side. And the gentleman's bone actually turned out to be a lot softer than I had anticipated. And so I, um, I was placing a 4.3 millimeter implant because that's all I had uh, in terms of bone there. And what I ended up doing was just taking my final drill, which was the 4.3 millimeter drill. And all I did was take it down about two or three millimeter millimeters just through the cortical bone and then I place the implant and I allow and the implant because it's a fairly aggressive implant um, you know expanded the bone and I got I got a decent torque value probably about 20 25 um, um, but if I had taken the final drill down then I would have probably been in a, in a lot more trouble I would have had to deepen it or place the wider implant which I was already getting the bones already fairly thin there um, and this is the case right here so ended up placing it about a millimeter subcrestal. And then I, and then I just, um, I, I completely buried it. So I'll come back in six months. So that's just a recent case where if I'd gone to the final drill, I would have been in trouble and nothing on the, on the CT scan, nothing about the patient um, would have indicated that the bone would have been softer. It wasn't a grafted site. So it's just something to keep in mind. I tend to favor higher torque values than anything. So, so guide stop adjustments, I was just mentioning that if you want to use the short drill, then it's important that you, you understand how to uh, adjust the, the guide stop, especially when you're in the posterior. During your implant consults, it's a good idea to you know, have a spare implant drill and maybe a short and a long uh, drill so you can see how wide the patient can open up. Uh, and can you get a drill back there? I know I've had some, I've had trouble with the short drill before. Uh, so I'm gonna take a quick uh, break from these slides and just open up the, um, the Blue Sky Plan software and show you how you can adjust the guide stop and you can potentially get a slightly longer implant in there with the short drill. So this is actually, this is the case I just showed you. That was the, the uh, surgical guide was printed with the Form 2 uh, printer. So if we look here, we'll turn our implant on, our guide tube on. I'm just going to turn the rendering off, and we'll hide the surgical guide. So this was treatment plan for... 
of a 4.3 by 8 millimeter implant, and you can see why. Uh, it, was, it was fairly thin. I probably could have gone a little bit um, deeper, maybe a 10 millimeter implant, but then again, we'd be getting closer. Um, we were getting closer to the lingual bone. So, because there was some buccal bone loss and the patient didn't want to graft, and I, I can't blame him. I mean, who wants to graft and either at the time of implant or, or six months later on a posterior site? Um, you know, I, I really can't blame him. He just wants to get his tooth back and the really aesthetics are not a big issue. And if you get a nice screw retained crown back there, you'll have a very good emergence profile anyways, even without grafting. But say, for argument's sake here, we wanted to place a uh, 4.3 by 11, 11.5 um, 11 millimeter implant. If you watch the guide tube, the guide stop, it's going to get much larger there, okay? And so you're going to, number one, have to use a long drill because that's what's treatment planned here. And in the posterior, it's going to be difficult to get that drill back there. The long drill is approximately 28 millimeters. Um, so there's a, the patient really has to open wide. So one of the things that you can do is you can adjust your offset. And if we enlarge, um, if we enlarge the screen here and we just turn this off and we look at what the offset does, the offset is basically, if we adjust it by one millimeter, it's the distance from the top of the implant to the top of the um, software guide hole. Uh, it's a little confusing. There's the software guide hole, and then there's the metal guide tube. Um, it says guide tube here, but there's but we're, just keep in mind we're talking about this orange ring, which is going to be printed out, and that's going to actually be what holds the metal guide tube. And I, I call that the software guide tube. Um, so by adjusting the offset, typically the default is nine, but if we drop it down by a millimeter and a half, to um, 7.5, then you see that the drill stop now is it's basically flush with, with the top. So you can use your 10 millimeter drill. And this is a trick to using the short drill in the posterior sites. Now keep in mind, by doing that, what we've done is we've gotten the, we've gotten the software guide tube probably impinging upon the tissue, but also getting closer to the bone here. So that's just something you have to keep in mind. If you drop it too low, then you probably will not be able to get your surgical guide to seat. The second issue that you have to be aware of, and this is uh, really important here. Let me just turn, I am going to turn this back on. Now it's not as big an issue in this case because we have the room to drop it down, but as the, I'll exaggerate here a little bit, and I will, I will take the offset and we'll make it five. So what you see is that the surgical guide, the guide, or the, excuse me, the software guide tube is now really impinging upon the tissue. So if you go to create your surgical guide on here, what will happen is people say, well, won't the surgical guide it'll impinge on the tissue. It actually won't. The software will cut anything that is projecting into the model, the software will eliminate. So, which is good, which is what it should do. But if you look and you turn all of these other pieces off, the top looks fine. But when we rotate it on the inside, you see how a lot of that software guide tube has been eliminated. So if you go to place your metal guide tube, which is about four millimeters in length, you've lost most of the support for the metal guide tube. So if you have this guide printed and you go to put your metal guide tube in, there's a chance that the guide tube will rock and it won't see, pro I mean, it, it won't be accurate. So to get around that, when you go to export this out, if you turn, this on and you flip it over see how now it's added in the software guide tube you can see all of this that you see below has been cut off when the surgical guide was made which is exactly what it should do
but by changing the offset, and obviously we went a little drastic here, we've lost a lot of the support for the metal guide tube. So now what we can do is we can export this out. If we export this out, you would choose your surgical guide, and you would also export out your guide tube, and the software will, will then combine the two. Now you may need to adjust this a little bit in the lab after it's printed, um, and that's something you need to be aware of. You know, if, when you look here, you know, obviously at this depth, you know, we really exaggerated. We'd be impinging upon the bone. That's something you definitely can't do. But say you are really impinging upon the tissue, number one is you just lay a flap and get the, the tissue out of the way, and you may have to make a minor adjustment to it. It's a similar thing that can happen when you impinge upon the teeth on either side. But that's just a little trick if you want to try to use the short drill in the posterior. Again, the other option you can do is you can treatment plan a 10 millimeter implant, plan on placing a 11 and a half, 13 millimeter implant if you like to place the longer implants. Make your osteotomy, take the guide off, enlarge it and deepen it by hand, and that's certainly an option as well. But just a little trick here. And we're going to go back to the slides. I think time's kind of always goes quicker than you think it will. Um, PVS and stone model scanning with CBCT. About two years ago, I did my first case where I scanned a stone model with the CT scanner. And, um, you know, it worked really well. So that's a really great option. And now um, you can continue to do that. The new update to the software makes it significantly easier and to import the stone model into the software and use it. And Dr. Ferguson has also come up with a technique where basically you take a PBS impression, scan that with the CT scanner, and then in the software, the software inverts it, or basically what I say is it does a digital pour of, the, um, of a model in there. So this is, this is a case I did on, this is about two years ago, um, scanning. And this, you, know, you can see the surgery went really well. It's exactly where it needed to be. We were half a millimeter away from the sinus. Um, so it worked out really well. And this is definitely an option. I personally, I don't usually do the PBS impressions. I like a stone model because I like, after my guide is printed, I like to see it on the stone model just to visually verify it. Uh, that's just my personal preference. But uh, PBS impressions work really well. Uh, and I think one other point, I always want to mention this. When you plan implants and you look at like the floor of the sinus or the nerve, always realize that the drill of the implant drills a little bit beyond the, um, where the implant will sit. It's about seven tenths of a millimeter beyond where the implant sits. So if you plan it right up to the floor of the sinus, just realize the drill itself is going to go seven tenths of a millimeter deeper. Um, usually the floor of the sinus, that bone's pretty solid, so you'd have to punch through it, but something to keep in mind. Um, if you're going to be using a scan appliance, then, and you work with a stone model, then you have the patient wear the scan appliance, and then when you scan the, the stone model, then you can scan it with the, with the uh, scan appliance on the stone model, and then you merge the two, and you can go ahead and create your guide right off of that, and it's only, it's two, scan, two quick scans. Uh, the scan appliances that I typically make, again, I like to work off of stone models, so I'll make a scan appliance. I have bags and bags of thermoplastic beads left over from NTIs, uh, the night guard. And so I will just melt those, form them onto the patient. And then Blue Sky Bio sells these little glass bead stickers. You put about six stickers on and uh, scan the patient and then scan the stone model separately. And that's a very easy scan appliance that you can make. Uh, if you decide to do the PBS scan, then you can take, you know, you take an impression of the patient and then scan the impression and import that into Blue Sky Plan. And then they do, they call it inversion, but it's basically just a digital pour, um, essentially pouring up a stone model in the software. It's actually pretty cool. Um, if you need to make a scan appliance, then you take some glass stickers and you can use those same stickers and put it on the impression tray and that'll function as your scan appliance. What you have to do though is you have to have the patient wear the PBS impression while you take the CT scan if you decided to do it that way. Um, and uh, so that's certainly an option for you. 
and I, I'll go through a couple, I'll go through how these two new functions work in the software real quickly at the end. Uh, the Form 2 printer, this, is, uh, this has been out for, I think, about nine months now. The, the original printer's been around for longer than that. And this update to the printer is really nice. And they just came out with the Surgical Guide Resin. The Surgical Guide Resin is, uh, you know, it's gone through all the testing and everything to make surgical guides. And, and uh, it's, it's, just, it's a really great printer. Um, it's an SLA printer. So basically, stereo, it means it's a stereolithographic printer. It has a laser that cures a layer at a time. So the laser will, um, the software will actually take a 3D model, it'll slice it, it'll make, say, 300 slices. Each, the laser will draw out one layer, and then the, the, the build platform, which is what the model sticks to, that's the top piece up here, uh, that will lift up and then come back down, and the laser will trace the next layer, and it'll lift up and come back down, and it'll do that depending upon how many layers. For surgical guide, it's probably about three to 400 layers, 50 microns on each layer, and until the guide's made. So it builds from, and these are called, bot, these are bottom-up printers. And, uh, you know, it's just a really uh, great printer to have. You can not only print surgical guides, you can print models. And so if you're going to get into 3D printing, yeah, it's probably your best option because it gives you the widest range, in my opinion. Um, I also have a, a filament printer that I can print surgical guides off of, and they come out, and they're, they're good quality, similar to the Robox printer. Um, so it's just, um, you know, just, just personal preference. I, I, I have both printers. I, I, I really do like the form, too. I think it's, really, I think it's a really uh, unique and great printer, especially, especially for the price. And again, this is this uh, surgery that I did that I showed earlier. Um, the little points that you see on the guide are where the attach the um, support structure that when the guide is being printed are held. And I just snap them off. I can smooth them all down if I want to, but there's really no point. And we've already seen this. Um, this is just a little screenshot. It, it, the additional step is from Blue Sky Plan, you export out the surgical guide, and then you bring it into the preform software, which is the Form 2 printing software. And then from there, you just um, you, you orientate the model, you add supports, and then uh, send it you, you know, it's over your network to the printer. One of the things to keep in mind is that if you, if you look at the software here, it looks like it's going to build it from the bottom up. But, um, it's actually going to be upside down if you look back here. It's actually going to build the top here down, and then this is the layer getting cured. So keeping that in mind, when you build your supports, if you decide to get a Form 2 printer, you want to make sure all your supports are on the outside. You can. This is one way to orient the model. You can also orient the model vertically. It'll take longer to print, um, but there's a bunch of different ways uh, that you want to orient the model. and. Uh, I've, I've done it this way and it works out really well. One of the things to keep in mind, if you, if you do own a Form 2 printer, I know a lot of people have just purchased one, you want to make sure that when you're printing guides to, to constantly move the guide all around on the table there. Um, it'll increase the lifespan of the what they call the vat, which is where the, the resin sits in it. Um, the vat degrades over time because of the laser and they're replaceable. So you just want to make sure you move the location of the surgical guide around. Um, before we get to the Blue Sky Plan software, which we'll finish up with tonight, uh, just want to mention we have the Blue Sky Bio Study Club face on Facebook, and you know it's a really great group. If you're a dentist and you're using Blue Sky Bio software, I highly recommend um, you join. Um, you'll learn a lot there. And this was a case I just grabbed this off of the web page today. And this is a case that somebody posted. You know, first anterior case with Blue Sky Plan. I've planned a 4.3 by 11 Biomax. Uh, any comments before I send this off to Barry at um, Digit3D Works? He does a lot of printing for people on the group if you don't have a printer. Um, and if you were on this web page, you'd see that Dr. Lerner, who is uh, one of the co-founders of Blue Sky Bio, he, he's on there posting as well. So you're not going to get um, 
you know, any better education than that. Uh, and then, of course, I hold some, I do some hands-on courses uh, for Dr. Garg and implant seminars. Our next course is going to be in Miami on October 29th. So if you're ever interested and you want to learn more about the software, you're having trouble, uh, and uh, it, it's a lot of fun. So I am going to switch over and to show. Can I jump in with a few questions? Oh, we have some questions? Yeah. Okay. Okay, first question is, what resolution are you mostly printing at for the guides? Well, on the Form 2 printer, the resolution is fixed. So the Z resolution is at fixed at 50 microns for the surgical guide. Um, that, the Z is the, is the thickness of each layer. And then if, if you, the laser itself, I believe, is, is 140 microns. So that's your XY, um, your XY resolution. Resolution in 3D printers is a little confusing, but with the, the Form 2 does not let you change that resolution. I don't know if they'll let us go to 100 microns. I've printed guides at 100 microns with their regular resin just to see, and, and they fit really well. But right now you're, you're, you're fixed at exactly 50 microns, and um, of course the laser size is the laser size. On the on the filament printer, you know, I just I don't print a lot of guides on that, but um, typically on filament printers uh, such as the Robox, usually if you take the size of the nozzle, which is around 0.3 millimeters, usually you print around half that size um, for your uh, your Z layer, which is your your layer height. That's usually what they say, they recommend, so. Okay, and so. the next question that you see up there, what if the patient had number six to 11, was the best way to make a scan appliance on them? Okay, so you're gonna need a scan. In that case, you may want to take an impression and you could do like, an, you could always do a, um, well, well, if you're going to make a scan appliance, I would take an impression and maybe make an Essex and then you could add the stickers onto that and have the patient wear that. Um, or you you might be better off doing the PVS impression in that case, and then adding the um, having the patient have the PVS impression with the um, the Blue Sky Bio um, the cone beam markers, and then scanning the patient with that, and then scanning the PVS impression. That's probably the best way to do it. But if not, the thermoplastic probably wouldn't work as well in that case because it because it's two distal extensions. Okay. Okay. Um, so I think I'll show the the um, I'll show the new the new software because I think it's um, it's pretty cool, and then we'll um, we'll end it here. I'm just gonna. Okay. So, and I won't go through all the. You know, a lot of this stuff you can see already on, on the web, how to make the guides and everything, but I'll just go over the new function functionality here. So now you have this new import DICOMs. You can import impression scan, model scan, or scan appliance. You used to only have import scan appliance. So this is a um, impression scan. Find your impression folder here. Uh, now the, the real question is going to be where do you start or what settings do you use on your CT scanner to scan a PVS impression and you really do have to um, play around with them. So far I've scanned with my CareStream scanner and I use the I use just the default scan appliance settings and they've worked out really well. I did scan with a I believe it was a new Tom at Dr. Garg's facility down in the Dominican Republic. And we also used the scan appliance settings and that worked out really well. So once we have imported it, you wanna flip it so you can see the occlusal. But you know what, I think I brought in the wrong model. Hang on one second. I'm gonna try that again. So I really haven't had a big issue with the settings on 
and scanning PBS or stone models. I just go right to the scan appliance settings on my CT scanner, but you may need to play around with them a little bit. And then in terms of what to put the stone model or the PBS impression on, you know, just uh, if you don't have a, a, a platform that came with it, then you would, um, you would, you would probably put it on a, um, like a piece of foam or something, something that's radiolucent. Um, so it brings in the uh, impression. You have a slider on the bottom here where you can adjust the density of the impression. If you look at the impression and you have holes on the occlusal, then you have to adjust it so that those holes are closed. That's one of the things you have to be careful about. You really don't want show through of the PVS impression. So we get here. We're going to click the next button. I mean, they've made this incredibly easy. And so what the software is doing is it's converting the um, DICOM data into the surface model, which is the STL model. And of course, it, it, um, I've got a bunch of programs open, but it, uh, it goes pretty fast. So now you have you know, a nice model here. You look around, make sure that there's no holes. And it's, uh, it's the maxilla. And we're going to be draw a limiting curve. Basically, you're just going to outline by pressing the Shift button and drawing where you want the model to be made. I don't even, I just click Create Inverted Model. It's that simple. And then let the software do its thing. And it's, it's inverting a model. It's basically just pouring it up digitally. I think it's the simplest way to think about it. It'll be done in just a minute. And there you go. And you have a really nice resolution model that you can work off of. Um, and uh, the, the resolution's definitely improved in the software. And these are certainly high enough resolution to make a uh, surgical guide on. If you continue through um, the alignment here, you would just do your normal alignment. And uh, I'm, I'm just going to kind of skip through. I'd normally place a lot more dots than that, than that but just for, um, for time's sake. And then, of course, you have to verify. This is, this is, I think, probably the most important step that you do. Uh, um, I mean, look at the alignment there. That's pretty good right off the bat. Um, but this is the most important step. I always go axial first, and then I look at my cross-sectional um, alignment just to see how it all looks. Um, but so that's pretty close. And then, and then you would just click next and you're, you're, you're in there and then they have a new wizard and I'm not going to do it because I, to be honest, I haven't even tried it yet, but they've got this brand new wizard that's out that has, um, that's going to be really cool. And it's going to make, it's going to, it's going to make, um, you know, your, your treatment planning and your, your guide fabrication significantly easier. They walk you right through it. So it's, it's, it's much, much easier than it's been in the past. And it just keeps getting easier. Um, if we do the stone model, it's basically the same thing um, as, the, as the PVS impression. The only thing is that you don't have to pour up the stone model. It's already been done for you. So. But I'll show it to you real quickly here, and then we'll finish up. And so you import a model scheme, find your stone model. And you can adjust here. You can adjust all these if you would like. And then similar to the PVS impression, we're going to adjust the density here. 
And then you just, uh, you know, you got the, you have the wizard down there, so it's going to tell you everything you need to do. But uh, you're going to click next, and then it's going to convert that into a nice model for you. Um, and then you'll go through your alignment, confirm your alignment, and finish. Um, So it's all it's all the same. All the same steps here. Just to respond to a question that came in, I mentioned this at the beginning of the presentation. The update is currently in a pre-release phase. If you want to receive a copy of it, then just email us at plan at blueskybio.com and we'll have it live on the Blue Sky Bio website probably within a week or two after we finalize some additional uh, review and testing. But if you want to receive a pre-release version, then you could do that by emailing us at planofblueskybio.com. Yeah. Um, and this is, the, this is the software for the form, too. I think um, you know once you get it, if you decide to get the printer, uh, I'm certainly playing around with settings for, print, for printing. You know, it's not going to be uh, the print, print takes about two and a half hours to print. So. And there's certainly um, improvements that will be made on orientation of the models and everything. And I think if you join the study club, you're going to find a lot of the information on on there. So um, I think uh, I think I covered everything that I wanted to cover tonight. And I hope you got some good tidbits out of this. And hopefully, if you're you know not sure how to proceed, you've at least got a good roadmap to get started. And you know you you can get all those drills, those guide tubes. And not break the bank, um, and you'll you'll get into guided surgery, and you'll build your confidence in guided surgery. Uh, and it's, it's how I started, and it's how a lot of people have started. And you can kind of go from there. Okay. So, if, there if there are additional yeah, questions, cool. you can enter them into the Q and A chat box. Basically, what Dr. Ravens just outlined is a process flow from CT to finished surgical guide in a matter of hours. You don't need any additional equipment. You can do everything in house. You know, assuming you have a CT scanner and a printer, but we have some of the printers that are out, the Form 2 and the Robox are extremely affordable. And essentially, they give you all the tools that you need to do their entire process flow in your office in a matter of hours. So, I mean, I think that's something that's extremely helpful and extremely uh, revolutionary. Yeah, I think it's fantastic. I mean, we're we're talking about doing guided surgery courses down in the Dominican Republic in a, you know, a third world country and with the printers and the software and everything, we're going to be able to do that. And I think that's pretty amazing, the, you know, especially where we've come in the last couple of years with the software. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Dr. Ravens, are there any words of caution or anything not to do for somebody that's getting started with this process flow to make sure that they don't, you know, have any pitfalls or anything? that uh, might get them on the first couple of cases? Is there anything they need to be aware of? Yeah, I, I think the most important thing is what you're looking at on the screen right now is your model alignment. It's almost, um, the the analogy I use, it's like ditching your dyes in, in school, you know, when you ditch your dyes for your crowns, if you haven't captured that margin perfectly, your crowns, you're gonna have an open margin. If you do not have confidence in your, um, model alignment, then that is where, I, in my opinion, most of the error is going to be introduced because you'll be treatment planning and your guide will always fit because the guide is made off of the, S, of the um, you know, of, of the, um, the STL model, the high resolution model. But um, if it's not perfectly aligned with the CT scan, then that's where you're going to get into trouble. So it's really important that you check, double check, and if you're having difficulty um, with model alignment, then either, you know, you might either think about scan appliances um, or, you know, having somebody help you. That's where the, this, I think the study club will definitely help. Um, and, you know, in those those cases, um, you know, you, you might not want to take that final direct cut drill right to depth if, you're, if you haven't got your model alignment. Um, but that's probably the most important step. Um, that you need to be aware of. Uh, the second most important step, and it pretty much it, it pretty much coincides with model alignment. You need a good full arch impression of the patient, and you always need a full arch CT scan of the patient. Don't try to do smaller, you know, segmental arches. 
because you will never be able to fully verify. So I think that's probably the most important thing to be aware of. And in what situations would you recommend the use of the scan appliance? Uh, you need, typically you need at least like about three, four non-restored teeth in, before you, uh, in order to be able to, uh, before you need a scan appliance. And I would say my sort of gut on it is always, if I think I need a scan appliance, then I need a scan appliance. But at, start looking. If you've been taking CT scans on patients, this is if if you if you take a CT scan on a patient and go back through some of your older scans and you look at this model here, the rendering that the software does, and you look at like what a PFM does. I mean, look at how much it just absolutely wipes out data on here. So the question is, is am I going to be able to get good, not only do I need at least three, four teeth, realistically five, um, but are they spread across the arch? So I'm going to be able to choose points on the posterior, the anterior, on, in the, you know, the posterior on both sides. So, you know, if you only have like seven, eight, nine, ten non-restored, but it's all PFMs in the posterior, and you're probably much better off with a scan appliance um, because you're going to be you, you're going to have a hard time telling if the posterior is lined up. But you can see how these PFMs back here have really made it difficult. Um, although you can see the occlusals are pretty good. The other thing I would say, and I, I didn't include this in there, but if you if you place Emacs, um, that's that that material scans almost exactly like enamel. In fact, I think it scans better than enamel. So um, if you're a CERIC person, you place an Emacs when you scan patients, it really does work well. Okay, now a question that came in. Do these printed guides typically require adjusting to get them to see on the model? No. I, I don't. I mean, I've, I, I've, the ones I've printed and then the ones that I've had um, Barry at Digit3D Works print, I pretty much never require any adjustment unless your model's off unless you've had a, a, uh, a model off. You know, the software removes undercuts and everything like that. So I've, I've almost never had to adjust it um, unless I know there's a little imperfection in the model. Okay, I think uh, that pretty much wraps things up. You could see all the thanks and the Great. appreciation that people are showing for the presentation. I'd also like to thank you from the Blue Sky Bio side for the time and for the overall contribution that you provide for education and for the software in general. So we really appreciate that. Yeah, well, thank you. It's been fun. It's been too long since I did a webinar, and it's, it's a lot of fun. So I hope everybody comes on to the Facebook page and joins us, and you'll learn a tremendous amount on there. Okay, and everybody who's attending should enter their details into the webinar attendance form. There are links underneath the video viewing the windows to make sure you get the C credit. And I'd like to once again thank Dr. Ravens and thank everybody who attended the presentation. And uh, we're going to sign off. Good night.